Okay, I'm going to start this final um, round table and I'm going to bring this um, uh, conversation uh, back to the story about Ukraine. We talk a lot um, about our um, you know, opinions and educated opinions, of course, um, about the effects of the Russia-Ukraine war on the EU, on NATO, on the transatlantic relationship and whatnot. Um, and we maybe talk much less than we should about the effects of the war on Ukraine itself. Um, and I suggested for uh, this uh, panel to have um, uh, three key points of discussion. Um, and um, in my professional life, I'm a lecturer in risk in international politics and economics at Johns Hopkins Science. And what we do there is we constantly try to make a big difference between what is risk and what is uncertainty. And we say that uncertainty is um, very different because um, uncertain, uh, risk is uncertainty that you can measure. So we need to understand all these different paths that Ukraine uh, can embark on uh, so that we can measure also the risks uh, for Ukraine. And of course, in, in the wider conversation on anything else that, that we care about, but we have to start. Uh, uh, with Ukraine. And that's what we aim to do today. And uh, the three points for conversation um, would be to understand uh, what is the future of uh, Ukrainian um, legal structure, sovereignty, and um, uh, this relates also to state capacity, what we've been discussing so far, uh, without a um, understanding of how Ukraine is engaging uh, with the contested territories uh, that it will have in, um, um, incorporated uh, for uh, the foreseeable future. We don't really know what is the, the path forward for Ukraine in relation to the EU either. The second point is about the citizens, uh, the Ukrainian citizens that have um, moved out of Ukraine and um, have gone mostly to the European Union, but who also plan maybe to go back. Uh, whatever is their choice, uh, and their experience will have a lasting impact on how Ukraine is going to move uh, forward. Um, and also their presence in uh, the EU is changing uh, both the formal relationships with Ukrainian citizens, but also the perceptions uh, that we, uh, we share of each other. And not uh, um, um, last but not least, uh, we need to talk about Russia, because whatever we discuss about how the EU is going to do um, going forward, how Ukraine is going to do going forward, it's always um, um, half a conversation if we don't also take Russia's intentions into account and whether we like it or not, whether it's going to be a stable or a less stable state going forward, it will impact the future um, of Ukraine um, in different ways. So I have three um, uh, great panelists for this conversation who will tackle each one of these issues. And we will uh, start first with um, Alina Solovyova, who is a legal scholar and a Jean Monnet fellow at the Robert Schumann Center. Alina will help us navigate the difficulties around um, uh, the sovereignty of Ukraine. Um, and then we will continue with um, uh, Yulia Lashchuk. She or Yulia will handle this conversation about um, the role of the citizens. Um, and then uh, we will um, let Olena um, uh, tell us everything that you ever wanted to uh, know about Russia and the Russia's impact um, on the narratives surrounding the future, uh, the present, the future, and also the past of Ukraine, because they are rewriting that as well. So the way we're going to do it is by first allowing each to um, express their main points in this idea, and then we're going to uh, have a conversation uh, and make this uh, sound round table-ish or around there. Okay, so Alina, do you want to take over? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> I am a lawyer and I want to talk uh, today about the future of uh, Ukraine sovereignty under the new conditions. 
After the collapse of uh, the Soviet uh, Union, the socialistic republics uh, became an independent state, but rather formally than practically. The uh, military conflicts in South Ossetia, uh, Abkhazia and Transnistrian Moldovan Republic, as well as the ongoing war in Ukraine, have shown that there is uh, still a necessity of reassessment, the role and importance of uh, international political institutions um, mechanism uh, for implementing the rules of international law. On uh, July 16, 1990, the Verkhovna Rada of Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic adopted the Declaration on the State Sovereignty of Ukraine, which defines the foundation of uh, state, political, and economic system and emphasized the independence and sovereignty of Ukraine. The declaration proclaimed the state sovereignty of Ukraine as supremacy, independence, completeness, and indivisibility of the power of the Republic. Uh, and uh, uh, Ukraine was uh, uh, restore, uh, sorry, uh, Ukraine was uh, recognized by Russia in December 1991. As uh, of the morning of September 22, uh, this year, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov said, I quote, Donetsk, Lugansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson Oblast can receive the right to self-determination in accordance with uh, United Nations Charter. Talking about the referendum and the right to self-determination, I would like to point out the few issues arises in this regard. Uh, there have been some discussions on where the referendum was, wasn't uh, legitimate, um, or uh, whether people who live in those regions desire to uh, live in a separate republic or become Russian citizens. To my mind, uh, the question that arises here is not who wants that, or uh, that means uh, had already been used uh, to realize the so-called right to self-determination, but rather the time point when this right is uh, to be claimed and the proceeding mechanism that have to be developed in order to realize this right. To put it simple, we can analyze the right to self-determination, look at it three uh, different branches of law. Uh, not only international law, but I think it should be uh, the constitution, domestic constitutional law, because it's very important to understand what does it mean people in this context, uh, the right of peoples to self-determination, Ukrainian people, for example, and uh, it should be international law because it's very important uh, to understand the correlation between uh, this uh, right of people to self-determination and uh, uh, the principle of uh, territorial integrity. And the uh, third uh, branch, uh, which is, I think, is very important because I'm a lawyer, and for me, it's uh, very important to understand what is the same difference between the right of peoples to self-determination and to crimes against national security. And um, uh, this is, I want to start uh, with um, issues under international law. Issues related to international law, it's conflict between, as I said, the principle of the people's right to self-determination and the principle of territorial integrity, understanding the concept of people's nation in the context of the right to self-determination, relationships, I think that is uh, much more than uh, only uh, discussion of uh, terminology. The problem of influence uh, of the basic principles of international law, in particular as the principle of self-determination of peoples and territorial integrity on the process of formation in new states, as well as correlation of these two principles of international law. It's one of the most relevant and uh, controversial in uh, contemporary international law. The self-determination of peoples and the territorial integrity of states as a fundamental principles. And there are a lot of opinions uh, 
for instance, uh, in uh, the international law, one uh, scholar uh, said uh, that uh, it's uh, about uh, that one principle of the international law uh, uh, much uh, important, more important than another one, but it's not true. It's all uh, two principles, the principle of rights uh, to self-determination and another one, uh, the territorial integrity. Um, it's uh, more not about uh, this principle. The principle of self-determination defined by the United uh, Nations does not grant an unlimited right to secession to the population living on the territory of any independent and sovereign state. And the right to secession, which is supported or encouraged uh, by a foreign state, uh, contradicts the principle of respect for territorial integrity on which the principle of equality of states is based. Is, uh, it's very important um, uh, to understand uh, that uh, this uh, principle of uh, uh, rights of peoples to self-determination, it's uh, very important to uh, create this uh, all analysis in three different branches uh, to understand one, uh, uh, one topic clearly, the right of peoples to self-determination. And that I mentioned before about uh, uh, Lavrov uh, said that it was uh, the right of people to self-determination. Uh, I think it's uh, very important uh, to understand uh, that there is uh, st uh, still a manipulation under this uh, um, principle in this time. Um, the only possible claim uh, for right of people to self-determination in the current situation of Ukraine may be uh, con uh, considered after the restoration of the borders of Ukraine of 1991. Uh, that would mean restoring the borders of Ukraine that once were recognized by Russia in December 1991. Taken into that once uh, were uh, one consideration any result of the referendums uh, that have been held since uh, 2000. Uh, uh, six, uh, 30, 13 would um, create an illegal pre precedent of realization of right to self-determination. I think uh, this is um, a negative impact uh, on EU, uh, for instance, because it's illegal precedent. In this precedent, it's a dangerous situation in uh, the uh, current situation, I think. <clears throat> uh, thus, uh, this would make sense even taking into account that some of Crimeans or even the majority of them tend to have anti-Ukrainian sentiments and recognize themselves as citizens of uh, Russia because of legal mechanisms. We need a legal mechanism. At, uh, and last but not least, uh, this approach would uh, require the development of clear mechanisms formalized in the relevant institutional norms, which would act as a, um, a guarantor of the national integrity of the state and the full realization of the right to self-determination of its uh, people. Um, at this time, I mainly focus on the time point, uh, so to say on when the right to self-determination has to be realized. Uh, the question how it should be realized. In these questions, it would be uh, next my point because it uh, needs to, uh, to research, to analyze uh, many cases uh, uh, under the, another situation about Yugoslavia, about uh, another uh, very important uh, uh, situation in our practicing. That uh, is my opinion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Um, listening to you, I'm, I feel very convinced, but um, I'm also not sure about the possibility of ever establishing territorial integrity first to 1991, then discussing the right to self-determination. I shouldn't say never, but I'm thinking in terms of foreseeable future. Um, um, if that is, uh, is not something that um, Russia would agree 
uh, to its um, in some form, then um, then we just reach another level of complexity and controversy even more. But we can discuss that um, in in the um, in the Q and A later. Now I want to draw our attention to something else when addressing what is a state. So we've discussed territory, we always discuss the legal framework, but a state is also the totality of uh, its citizens. And for the time being, that totality of citizens in Ukraine is uh, um, fleeing uh, this territory. That doesn't mean that uh, Ukraine doesn't have uh, both a um, responsibility for its um, um, citizens who are now abroad, but also it will have a, possibility, a, a responsibility in the future for the reintegration of those citizens. So um, I will give the floor to Yulia Lashuk, who is a Max Weber Fellow um, here at the EUI and who is coming to us from the University of Warsaw and, and Ukraine also, more, more importantly. Yes, thank you so much, Veronica. I thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, yeah, so I am the one who, who cares about people. I use a lot of data and today I will speak numbers to you, but uh, let's uh, remember all the time that behind all those data, we have real people with real stories, real backgrounds and uh, their personal uh, tragedies. The tragedies. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we all know that the outbreak of the war in Ukraine has set in motion the migration potential of uh, the scale that has not been observed since uh, the Second World War. Uh, the magnitude of the influx uh, of people fleeing the war in Ukraine is enormous, especially if we uh, speak of those countries uh, such as Poland or um, uh, other, other neighboring Ukraine countries, which until recently could uh, hardly be described as a destination of uh, Im 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 immigration. For example, Poland was uh, perceived as an emigration uh, country for a long time, at least until uh, 2014. Uh, so for, for today, uh, we have uh, more or less uh, seven and a half millions of uh, Ukrainians registered um, in the European Union uh, as, as a refugee, as a, as a people uh, fleeing the war in Ukraine. Uh, almost uh, half of them are already registered under the temporary protection uh, directive or some other uh, national uh, schemes. Um, what is interesting about this, this kind of migration that uh, almost around 90% of them are women. Uh, many uh, of those women, they uh, come to the European Union with their underage children. Um, they, are, they have a good level of education. Um, around 45%, they have higher, higher uh, education. 73% uh, of them, they were employed in Ukraine before, before leaving Ukraine because of the war. Uh, they were employed mainly in education sector or um, um, services or, or trade, uh, trade sector. Um, again, we have to uh, we have to remember that uh, Ukrainian migration into EU is not a new phenomenon. Um, uh, but uh, it's it's different, right? So uh, before the before the February 2022, the migration Ukrainian migration to the European Union was um, well, it was 50-50 almost, uh, but with a slightly uh, bigger percentage of uh, male uh, migrants, uh, with exception of Italy, of course, where uh, almost 80% uh, of Ukrainian migrants were women, which was. Um, uh, caused by uh, gendered uh, employment. So basically, mm, this was the reason. But uh, normally, uh, normally, uh, men and women would would migrate uh, for for economic reasons, um, um, more or less equal uh, equally. Um, it gives, in my opinion, some advantages uh, for Ukrainians in, in the EU in the current situation. 
uh, first of all, they are a good known in Europe already. Um, so if you compare, for example, the attitudes uh, towards Ukrainians, um, they are rather positive uh because uh because uh, people already know who they are they know that uh, also those uh, like let's say positive stereotypes uh work uh, here so ukrainians are hardworking, uh, they're honest and so on and of course uh now we speak of women and children it means that uh, of course the attitudes are are uh, more positive uh, they have already established networks in uh, in the European Union, uh, also uh, professional networks, which uh, helps um, to adapt uh, more easily. Uh, and of course, the role of the diaspora is not the last role here. Uh, diaspora supports and uh, helps as well to uh, adapt in the new place of dwelling. Um, in case of some countries, uh, we speak of uh, language and cultural similarities, for example, Poland or, or uh, Slovakia or uh, Czech Republic, um, which also helps to integrate and to find work more easily. But uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, some uh, there is a danger here because uh, similarities do not mean absence of differences and uh, the local governments uh, and the governments should uh, take this uh, into consideration. Um, and of course, last but not least, uh, the advantage for a current situation is the fact that um, uh, Ukrainian women started migrating alone um, after the in the 90s, right? Uh, so they they uh, gained their subjectivity. They learned how to how to survive. They were breadwinners for their families. So uh, now it helps them again to uh, to adapt more easily and to to find um, their path. Uh, but there are also uh, many disadvantages and risks uh, for the Ukrainians in the EU, um, taking into consideration that 90% of them are women, as I said. Uh, there is a vulnerability, and so gender-based violence, uh, human trafficking, um, exploitation, both economic and uh, sexual. Um, of course, uh, they all have psychological trauma, which leads uh, to the fact that it's very difficult for them to uh, start a new life right away. Um, and of course, uh, a poor language prof proficiency that uh, leads to uh, the fact that they are just forced to take simple jobs uh, that do not require to the, the knowledge of the language. And I'm not... Um, I mean here, uh, well, in Europe, uh, if, if you want to get uh, a, a better job, uh, English is not enough, for example, in Poland or in Czech Republic. So uh, you have to really know a local language to be able to, um, to, to get a job. Um, and again, the situation of precarity, precarity not only economic, uh, but um, existential precarity. Uh, the, first of all, the status. We call it temporary protection, which means that it's temporary. So uh, it's three years maximum. Um, and people started to realize that, well, maybe what, what, what do we do next, right? What do we do next after those three years if uh, the war is still, uh, is still uh, going? Uh, the problems with the housing, the problems with work and a really unclear uh, vision of the future. So basically at present, it is very difficult uh, to predict the future of, of those people. Um, uh, the number of refugees, uh, the same as the number of returnees to Ukraine, depends mainly on the events in Ukraine. 
And but in any scenario, uh, we are sure that uh, we will see more migrants from Ukraine in the European Union uh, even after the war is over. Uh, the key question that I would maybe underline today is uh, how many people will be back when and where they will they will go because uh, for now according to data 81 percent of uh, of ukrainians uh, want to go back home only four percent of them they they want to stay um, in their current uh, place of of dwelling uh, so the rest they don't know but 81 percent they want to go home uh, but among those who said, yes, I want to go to Ukraine, 16% uh, uh, they uh, know for sure that uh, their uh, homes, places of origin are partially or uh, fully damaged. And 12% of them, they don't know this, the status. So basically we have 28% of people who don't know, they want to go back home, but they don't know where to go and if they're ever able to, to go back. Um, now, when asked if they are ready to go uh, home after three months, even in a three months, uh, only 13% said yes. And the main reason for not uh, wanting to go back was a safety reason. So basically, um, this, this is it. Uh, we don't know when the war will, will end. But we know that we will always have that uh, neighbor next to us. So what do we do in this situation? How do we guarantee a security for those people? How do we make them to come back? Um, maybe I will stop here and then we can continue. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe for your second intervention, you can also tell us uh, how do we do it? Yeah, that would also be, uh, you have five minutes to think about it and then let us know. Um, and uh, in the meantime, we're going to um, um, also address maybe not the final point of what makes a state, but definitely one of the most important ones, um, which is, you know, the imagined community uh, that comes also with the stories attached to it. And there is a very powerful actor uh, who is a you know, neighbor of Russia, of uh, Ukraine right now, Russia, who is rewriting the narrative about what Ukraine is and, and what the uh, Ukrainian um, uh, people represent without their consent, of course. Um, and we are lucky to have uh, with us for, the, for this year at um, the Schumann Center as a, a Jean Monnet Fellow uh, Olena Sniger, who um, is also uh, coming from Ukraine, and uh, before coming here, or I think um, I shouldn't say before, um, um, because you I, you still um, you continue to coordinate the project of the Virtual Museum of Russian Aggression, um, and um, uh, that is associated with the uh, Ukrainian Institute of National um, uh, Remembrance. So, welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, um, I'd like to draw your attention to, um, to the picture that I uh, asked to show um, uh, on the screen. It's the picture of the last night. Uh, it's the consequences of the last Russian shelling of, of Ukraine. And it's uh, the, the dark black spot in the middle of it, it's Ukrainian territory. And um, yeah, it's uh, like many people are still like for 50 hours there uh, without uh, electricity, without uh, heating and without water. Uh, so it's a um, dark, dark period, but um, we don't know what will come in the, in the future. But it's, it, this picture also uh, uh, reminds me um, it brings me to the narratives and to the a collective memory and historical memory, because when I look at this picture, uh, I think that uh, maybe this is a picture also of knowledge in uh, our presence of Ukraine in uh, collective memory of uh, uh, European countries or European Union, because European Union has the policy of historical memory and has the policy of collective memory. But uh, place of Ukraine there is not very vis visionable. Uh, 
tomorrow uh, will be a very important day for Ukrainians. It will be the last uh, Saturday of November. And then this day we commemorate the victims of Holodomor. Is the um, artificial um, famine uh, created, organized by Stalin regime in 1932-1933. Uh, the result of which uh, were like we have the approximate results like three and a half up four million people dead. And it was um, a planned and targeted mass murder and an ultimate manifestation of a genocidal policy of Stalin regime towards the Ukrainian people. A few days ago, a um, few days ago, uh, Romania, uh, Ireland, Czech Republic, and Moldova uh, recognized Holodomor as, a, as a, a crime against humanity and as a genocide. And we are very grateful to these countries. Uh, a few years ago, European Parliament recognized Holodomor as a, um, a crime against humanity. Uh, still, uh, as there is a lot of work in the future because I, I um, from what I also learned uh, from my uh, uh, travel, not traveling, but for forced movement to Europe uh, from March, that uh, Europeans do not have uh, not only um, understanding about past of, uh, of 20th century, common past of common vision of common past of 20th century, uh, about Holodomor, for example, or early ages, uh, 20s, 30s, but also about the Second World War. I was quite surprised about the different difference between what my Dutch friends uh, know about uh, the Second World War, what is in their historical memory and what is in my historical memory. For example, um, for us, it's very important. Uh, there is a very important fact as a cooperation between Soviet regime and Nazi regime uh, during the Second World War and the start of Second World War. And uh, my uh, Dutch friends, they knew nothing about that. And uh, as well, um, so they did, they, they uh, didn't remember, they didn't know about Pact, or Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and uh, some other uh, case, some other facts. So it's, uh, it's just a matter also, I think it's a home task also for uh, historical memory and for collective memory policy of the European Union, because because uh, here um, uh, here is uh, well what hasn't been done. The crimes of Soviet regime haven't been crimes of Soviet regime against humanity, not only Holodomor, but forced deportation of the whole ethnic groups and nations, such as Crimean Tatars, also Ukrainians. Um, uh, Chechens uh, and other other nations, um, uh, killings, mass killings of intel in, in, intelligentsia, um, intellectual people of many nations, uh, concentration camps in Siberia, in the far east of Russia. These whole um, crimes haven't have never been condemned properly on international level as crimes of humanity and that's that's why putin today has the possibility to declare that uh the soviet union the collapse of soviet union was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe and many people listen to him and think that probably he is right because soviet union appears to be such a wonderful country that uh had a victory over Nazism in Europe, but at the same time, no, like, like few people realize that it was also very cruel and uh, regime that committed uh, terrible crimes against humanity. So probably this this is what has to be done in future to prevent that what that what wasn't done, and that that's why that's why we think we suppose we think that we estimate that. Um, because it hasn't been done, so that that's also stimulated the aggressive policy of Russian regime, authoritarian regime. So today, the second point that I would address now, I would like to address now, um, it's um, that uh, many uh, Russian liberals and many Russian like democ democrats in exile 
today and in many intellectuals discuss why, uh, what is the reason of uh, failure of democracy in Russia. And um, uh, yeah, there were a few, well, few estimations that I heard already that uh, the difference between Ukraine and Russia, that Ukrainian people, they had experience of free elections after the collapse of Soviet Union. So this positive experience of democratic process that inspired Ukrainians. And that's why we um, like have this value, have this feeling of value of democracy. And um, Russians didn't, didn't have it. So that's why they do not, do not feel this value of, of, of democracy, of democratic uh, processes. So that, and then, but, but still, um, uh, like many, um, most Russian liberals that today believe that the short period of the collapse of Soviet Union gave hope for the democratization of Russia. Uh, but however, these discussions are, would have been more substanti substantial if they took into account not only the issues of political and institutional processes, but also the political culture, values, and ideology of Russian elite. Because, because one can uh, today also hear careful attempts to analyze these reasons, and mostly everyone agrees that uh, Russian society has preserved the ideology of totalitarian thinking. In particular, Lev Gutkov, the head of Levada Center in Russia, he claims that this preservation became possible due to the regeneration of totalitarian thinking or ideology through state and social institutions. And also he claims that um, this uh, process started in Russian empire, went through Soviet Union and uh, manif manifested it in today's Russia. So it has a very, very um, long continuity in, in, in time. And by examining the narratives used by Russian propaganda and Russian politicians, including Putin, regarding the war against Ukraine since 2014 already, uh, we can see that uh, the persistence of ideas, the persistence of political, culture, and imperial worldview from the Russian empire through Soviet times and uh, their development in modern <coughs> forms in Russian and Putin's Russia. So therefore, before speaking about possibility of democratic developments uh, on the territory of Russian Federation, uh, I would say that the process of decolonization in this part of Eurasia is to be finished. And here I would stop and uh, leave the go to the next round and leave the floor to fathers. So if it's, a, it's also okay with you to have your um, questions ready, I'm just going to ask a, a brief follow-up questions of our panel um, to make sure that they get all their points across. And um, um, I will go back to um, Alina now, and maybe from your legal perspective, you could tell us a little bit more of how do you anticipate all these complexities to um, work in the greater framework that, as you've heard you know, about the EU as well, this organized chaos or organized anarchy that the EU um, uh, law and um, formal structures uh, are represented by. So uh, how do you think that these two could work together um, in a way that could be beneficial for Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, I would like uh, to say, uh, first of all, uh, some uh, sentences about your first words about that Russia won't uh, agree with uh, uh, restoration of the borders of Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, it should be not about uh, agree or not, uh, not agree. It should be legal precedent because it's a real dangerous situation about future of uh, Ukraine and uh, uh, world. Um, why? Uh, because um, of the situation that uh, uh, was created by Russia. Uh, imagine that, uh, let's imagine that we all was, were born in uh, Soviet Union and we are living now in the Soviet Union and we are all speak Russian 
we are all we go to Russian schools, we uh, are watching TV in Russian, we uh, don't have enough uh, uh, literature in Ukraine. I remember my young uh, years when I um, uh, don't want to read uh, uh, books uh, in Ukraine. I prefer Russian literature. It was um, much uh, more interesting, easy. It was uh, easy for me to read in Russian. And they knew you are in uh, independence. You are uh, the citizen of uh, the independent state. And uh, now you um, at the university, you are working there or you are studying there in Ukrainian language. That's uh, why I mention this because of uh, people who are living now at uh, Kherson region uh, in Donetsk, Lugansk. Uh, it's uh, very important to understand uh, how it's a very good uh, field to come Russia, good Russians and they uh, create a good future for these people. These people, some of them are lost because of uh, 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 this situation. Uh, it is not only about Ukraine. Maybe it's the same point uh, we can think about Lithuania, Estonia, but they uh, were clever than the uh, Ukrainian government. They uh, didn't give so many uh, literature, so many use in uh, Russian, because it's very important. Language is very important. Now I understand this, and all Ukrainians now understand that language is important. And uh, uh, as um, to my mind, I think uh, uh, Russia created a good field to, to come one uh, day and say it. But as I mentioned before, uh, Russia was, uh, Ukraine was recognized by Russia in December 1991. And I want uh, that we uh, are together, uh, we will be thinking about legal precedent. Uh, that's why I mentioned about uh, the restoration of the borders of Ukraine of 1991 and about European future and uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, future of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty, for example. Um, we uh, were uh, listening uh, to uh, all speeches, very interesting speeches about the future of uh, EU and uh, about, for example, uh, that uh, Ukraine received, uh, have already received the status of the candidate uh, and uh, about um, the correlation with uh, Turkey, for example. Uh, I have been working uh, for many years as the Minister of Justice of Ukraine. And uh, 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 my experience in this field, uh, I was a part of uh, many programs and uh, we uh, created a lot of uh, legislation, a lot of uh, laws under this uh, to be, um, uh, and we're proud of this st status because of our work, uh, works that uh, uh, we did all these years. It uh, have been, uh, uh, for many years, maybe 10 years, we changed criminal court of Ukraine, for example, we changed all crimes, uh, uh, we prevent uh, corruption uh, crimes in Ukraine, we create, uh, uh, um, after the European uh, um, uh, critics of uh, Ukrainian system, uh, Ukrainian government uh, creates a new um, court system, uh, for example, anti-corruption court, uh, uh, new um, uh, institutes under the criminal court, uh, uh, legal uh, entity as a subject of uh, uh, the crime. We didn't have this institution under our legislation. And now we're uh, really happy about that uh, Ukraine uh, have already had the status as a candidate and uh, uh, we hope it's not like a gist of support. <laughs> uh, it's our hope. We are three of us, we are women, and uh, we have uh, 
women hopes that uh, we will have a positive future for Ukraine and uh, will 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 be a part Ukraine will be a part uh, and not uh, like uh, a lot of problems a lot of issue, issues issues uh, and uh, uh, good relationships and positive uh, uh, precedent that's why um, it's very important uh, for us that uh, Ukraine uh, have already had the status. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alina. Um, I'm gonna um, give it, uh, the floor back to Yulia now, uh, who did tell us, um, reminded us that the order of magnitude um, of the incoming refugees is um, uh, unprecedented, but um, EU's ambivalence and uh, lack of clarity about what to do uh, in the long run with, uh, with the people coming is not. So uh, the EU unfortunately does have um, a track record of um, um, ambiguity, uh, although it, it's often called constructive ambiguity. And I think uh, we need a little bit of cheering up uh, at this point, maybe you can identify uh, some areas where the EU is, or even member states, if the EU is not um, the, the first place to go, uh, where some sort of arrangements have been uh, put forward to help uh, uh, Ukrainians in the long run, um, or is it just this temporary uh, directive uh, that is being used, which is very useful, but it's temporary and it's not being renewed uh, in a way that gives any kind of clarity uh, to the people of Ukraine. Uh, thank you so much. Well, I'm not a political scientist or not a lawyer, so uh, I don't really have uh, an answer to your question, but um, the one thing I know for sure that uh, there is a strong need, at least from our side of, uh, of migration, migration scholars, of uh, some common uh, strategy, uh, how to deal with this issue um, that would uh, be based on um, a different scenarios of the future. Uh, and so those, those um, actions and those suggestions, recommendations, uh, would be easily uh, ad adaptable for for uh, those uh, scenarios because we don't know uh, as I as I mentioned before when uh, the war will will end. Um, so we don't know when uh, when those people uh, will be able to to go home or if they ever go home. So because the time is not our friend here, right? We were talking with you, I guess, about the uh, Syrian, uh, Syrian refugees in Oslo, in, in uh, Norway. They were planning to go back home, but now when they are there for years, they have their lives there, they have their jobs there, and their children were already born there. It's not that easy to go back. And so here I would propose to look at this issue on three levels, a level of European Union that, um, well, have to, has to deal with this and uh, accommodate, accommodate uh, its own needs, but also accommodate the needs of, of, the, of Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainians uh, fleeing the war. Uh, so, as far as I know, many countries who didn't have any strategies for integration, for example, Poland wasn't, wasn't prepared at all for this and only uh, thanks to our civil society and diaspora, like this all uh, grassroots initiatives, actually Poland survived uh, survive this, this uh, terrible situation. So, of course, now, now only now they've started working on um, um, just creating this, this national strategy uh, of my, for migration. Um, yeah, so, and uh, more and more we could, we could hear uh, the, the narratives about, uh, well, let's integrate Ukrainians as soon as possible. So in the future, we will, we will pre prevent all the possible like difficulties, co uh, conflicts in the future. But uh, here we have another actor, uh, Ukrainian uh, government. 
that um, well is really grateful uh, to the European Union for for uh, for its help because it's it's a really important it was really important help to accommodate uh, those women with children to give them shelter um, while uh, the country is is defending itself right just to just to uh, just to give them temporary uh, temporary protection uh, and shelter uh, but ukrainian uh, ukrainian state of course wants those people to go back and rebuild the country we don't know when we don't know uh, where they will go at the first place but of course ukraine wants them to go back so uh, those integration strategies that uh, European Union is implementing or will, would like to implement, they have to take into consideration also um, U- Ukrainian point of view. For example, Ukrainian, uh, ambas- Ukrainian embassies and uh, Ukrainian state is very um, sensitive about the language that we use. This is what, uh, what Alina have mentioned before. Um, they ask not to speak about integration, but possible integration, you know, just to give those people a choice uh, and to, to let them choose by themselves if they want to stay in their new place of dwelling or they want to go back to Ukraine. So don't uh, propose them uh, to be part of your society, but don't push them to integrate here and now. Uh, And of course, the third level that is uh, very often forgotten, but I I really uh, try to underline its importance, is the level of um, of migrants themselves. What do they want to do? What do they want to, uh, where do they want to be? They're in the middle. They are in the situation of this this precarity, existential precarity. Um, The first strategy uh, for them at the beginning was to lay low and wait. Now they see that, well, it's not really possible to, to, to wait because we don't know the future. The future is unclear. So they, they, try, to, um, they try to survive somehow. Uh, for example, many, uh, many very qualified uh, women in, in Poland, because uh, Poland, this is my, my country of, of, uh, of expertise where I work, um, they were on purpose, they were taking this, uh, this simple jobs because it was easier to leave. It was just easier to, it was easier to get uh, those jobs, but it was easier to, to leave if they decide to go home tomorrow, right? So now the strategy is changing. Um, and I would say it's a very complex question and we have to, we have to take into consideration those three uh, levels that I've just mentioned. And the um, communication between the European Union and the Ukrainian government is very, very important here. Just not to, you know, to uh, stand, w- stand with Ukraine uh, and not to make it uh, worse for Ukraine. Yeah, thank you. Um, Olena, if you could um, maybe tell us more about this idea about uh, strategy for communication, uh, because um, as you are an expert on how Russia is rebuilding the narratives around Ukraine, um, I could also observe from my own research and unfortunately some um, interactions that we've had with um, um, IR scholars who, a specific IR scholar who visited the EUI recently, who is spreading a lot of, of the misinformation that Russia is also using um, to um, um, explain what is happening from their side in, in Ukraine. So unfortunately, it does seem to have picked up this alternative um, explanation of what is happening to Ukraine as being um, just um, um, a way to fight back NATO and the EU. And um, it's it's completely, of course, disrespectful to the efforts of of Ukrainians themselves. Um, But it is picking up speed. And a lot of people are uh, increasingly believing that um, uh, Ukraine shouldn't be supported um, uh, so much because it's a it's a pan-Slavic conflict, just like Lavrov uh, has put it himself. Uh, so I wonder, where do you see, from your perspective, um, uh, this um, 
communication strategy that does seem successful uh, from the side of Russia going um, in the future? Um, and is, is there any, any way that um, um, uh, the EU could uh, perform better at fighting it? Yeah, that's a good question, really good question, because the, the danger is still uh, very high and the, the risk is, is re really high <clears throat> because Russia has a lot of money and propaganda works really, really well. Um, and um, so what is the only, the only possible solution is building a uh, better awareness of what is happening, uh, working on purpose with journalists, uh, creating more academic um, uh, space for Ukrainian studies, um, watch, looking at Russia uh, from the different perspective, not from Russian point of view, but from the perspective of the last uh, empire on the European continent that still exists and that still uh, makes its uh, colonial brutal policy and uh, that is uh, in, in its values is far back in medieval ages and but at the same time which is quite sophisticated in methods and in rhetoric to convince uh, its European partners uh, that uh, these values are still European, but just a bit different. Um, maybe not democratic, but still Russia is still a European country, but it's, it's, it's a bit different. Its values are a bit different. So not to be uh, like misguided by this, um, um, these interpretations and this um, uh, manipulations because uh, it's very it's very tricky and it's very risky and uh, here I would say that the uh, clear terminology must be um, like is is very very wanted and this is very visible uh, like you if you say that it is democracy then it is democracy and you, if you speak about democratic values like freedom of speech and um, basic human rights then there are freedom of speech and basic human rights no peculiarities like uh, i would say that it's also a homework maybe it's also another homework for European Union and the whole democratic European community to understand what happened with the Council of Europe. Why Russia for such a long period was uh, a member of the Council of Europe committing crimes in Chechnya for 10 years, committing crimes in Georgia since 2008, and still Russia was a member of Council of Europe. It wasn't kicked out. What was that? That is big question. There must be, I think, the investigation, internal investigation. Because for example, uh, I will find this quotation of uh, Torben Jagland, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, because I like it very much, I actually love it. So when he said, directly said that after Russia's refusal to pay membership fees, the organization had two options, either to preserve the values or to preserve the Council of Europe itself. So my question is then, what is the Council of Europe for what it was, then not for values, for fees? Uh, so this is also the, the big, big question for future and for uh, preservation uh, of uh, European democracy and European community because democracy is not given for granted. Democracy is a quite big and hard work. Also, there is a question about Hungary today. I do not want to elaborate on it, but it's, it is in the air. And uh, yeah, I would also say about, so it's all the, your question, answering your question is in this sphere. So if without, without uh, solving the basic problem of, uh, um, of all that I have said already, uh, this issue uh, will not be will not be solved because the propaganda works so so sophisticatedly that I would say only one thing at the end that the the big plan Ukraine is not the final um, aim for Russia. Actually, Ukraine was 
necessary for Russia as Belarus is uh, as a um, reserve, reserve of uh, military power. So uh, if Russia gets the population of Ukraine plus population of Belarus, then it has uh, like it would have it, it, it would have had if it got it would have had uh, quite a big uh, military uh, force alive like manpower man military power and uh, propaganda would have done probably its job and convert Ukrainians against uh, Europe in a very, very short period. That's, that's, that is real threat. Um, so that's what should be done probably. Uh, one, to have about 10 minutes and then we have to have a hard stop. So, Yosef. Okay, thank you very much, all three of you, for uh, really interesting uh, presentations and bringing us into uh, some of the thinking about uh, about the development currently. Um, I think your, uh, I mean, the case of the current war raises um, one important question for um, for Ukraine, but also for Europe, and that is, what is the role of? And this is a kind of a paradox. What is the role of patriotism in maintaining the post-national order in Europe? Let me elaborate. There are three factors that actually enable us to be sitting here quietly discussing prices of gas. Uh, and that's US military support to Ukraine, UK military support to Ukraine, and in particular, the Ukrainian bravery and patriotism, the social structure of patriotism in Ukraine that enable this country to maintain the liberal order intact to some extent, right? So I guess the question is, what is the enabler of this enabler? And that is this social structure of patriotism. What is the role of patriotism in Ukraine, but also then in Europe? Because that's the question that Ukraine now raises for us. How can we work with, is there potential with patriotism? And can it be incorporated into what we often think about as a kind of a post-national constellation? <laughs> right. Uh, thanks. Thank you uh, for three of you for that uh, important comments. And well, as uh, I, I as a PhD researcher here at the UI, as an Ukrainian myself, obviously that was very interesting for me to listen to all of you. And even though like uh, the question would be addressed for like each of you, I think I, because all your speeches uh, raise some question. Uh, but like you're free to answer the, uh, that as you want. So first of all, I when I was listening to the speech about uh, immigrant um, immigrants from Ukraine, I would say that uh, there is also another negative tendency. Uh, and uh, well, um, I'm interested what you think about that about the so-called uh, negative attitudes towards Ukrainians from other uh, immigrants because there is a lot of, there there have been lots of discussion about European Union whiteness and uh, you, uh, that you, uh, European Union tend to accept U Ukrainians uh, you know uh, because they are white Europeans and uh, that's why there is um, they reject in some some sort of reject other immigrants when they come to European Union, and that created that was widely used by Russian propaganda in order to turn some some of the nations uh, against Ukrainians first of all and well against the European Union. And another question, at, well, it's more about heredity of uh, of Russia and heredity of Ukraine as well. So if you talk about the now today's Russia, we can definitely say that it claims to be the heir of uh, of Russian Empire and also the heir of uh, Soviet Union. So the, basically the the nation that uh, had had lasted for centuries that have been there forever. So the uh, that is definitely the hair. While Ukraine, being an independent state, tried to avoid to mention this heredity uh, with uh, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. So we try uh, to avoid 
saying that this is our collective memory being part of the Soviet Union. So like, do you think as thinking from the perspectives of um, collective memory, do you think that this creates some sort of um, negative impact on Ukrainian citizens? Like as we don't have somehow uh, some heredity from another country we, we derive from somehow. So, uh, uh, you know what I mean? And then the, another question, it was more, the one, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the panel has to, uh, uh, everybody has to leave. It's uh, at uh, 3.45, I understand. So, okay. yeah, so that's why there's a bus situation. I was oh, okay. So um, um, if you could answer those questions, uh, or you have a question, Bridget? Just my, 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 uh, my question is, will, is very quick. There is obviously a narrative battle uh, and a communications battle, but my view is that Ukraine has won this communications battle hands down. I mean, if you think of the overwhelming support in the European Parliament for uh, declaring Russia a, a terrorist state, uh, equally all those flash Eurobarometers show support for sanctions 80% plus, and, and I think President Zelensky in particular has been a master of communication in this war. So um, if you put Zelensky here and Putin there, I think it's a very unfair competition to Putin in terms of capacity to influence narratives. You know, he's wooden, he's at the other side of long tables, the imagery is... So I, I understand the, the, the threat and the fear but I, I would say, I think Ukraine and the Ukrainian authorities have won this battle, the communications battle, hands down. But maybe I'm missing something. If you want to take these questions, um, Olena. Um, yeah, I can pick up two questions right now. First, about this communication battle. Yeah, uh, Russians do not uh, try... I see one risk, one big risk. Russians do not try to convince everyone to love them again. But they try to, what is the, their main strategy now is these negotiations, that Ukraine has to accept negotiations and to like, yeah, we are bad, Russia, Russia is bad, Russians are bad, we agree, but Ukraine must accept negotiations. And this is, we see it uh, like this, this level of supporters of negotiations among ordinary Europeans and in the world is raising. And here is uh, another threat. If negotiations start, that means that there will be no tribunal. Uh, we need this tribunal, we need the defeat of Russia and we need tribunal to punish criminals without, if we start negotiations with them, then it will like change everything. It will, so, so here is the point. Uh, Russia is pushing everyone now to this negotiation narrative. And this is very, very dangerous um, because then Russia will gain a period for like a break, a pause in this war get up forces and it will this horror will continue. And about the her heritage or heredity, Ukraine has, has, has historical heritage except the Soviet Union it was just forget and it was just erased from our collective memories, the heritage of Ukrainian national, uh, Ukrainian People's Republic in uh, the beginning of the 20th uh, century, which existed for two years or for four, for four years actually, which was recognized by uh, European countries uh, by this brest uh, uh, litovsk agreement and uh, which was conquered by Bolsheviks. And after that, we had experienced red terror, um, uh, all this uh, like Soviet uh, crime, Stalin uh, repressions, and then at the end, Holodomor. So uh, Ukraine has a historical heritage except the Soviet Union and about historical memory of Soviet Union, we do not deny it. We do not refuse it. We just separate the criminal part, the crimes, and the historical memory, the lives of ordinary people, the heroism of ordinary people, their collective memory. So we explain it. We have this process of decommunization in Ukraine and it goes quite smoothly and it still separates the good and the bad 
it explains, it doesn't ruin everything, but it explains people what was bad, what was good. So here is, it is a story. It's not the story of denial. We do not deny this heritage. We just separate it. And we have our own history to be uh, proud of and to have it as a basis of collective memory. There's a, there's a question about patriotism. If someone would like to pick that one up. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I want to answer about patriotism, it's a, if it is possible. It will uh, sound uh, weird, but I want to say that uh, thanks Russia, they uh, created uh, us all pa as patriots uh, now. Uh, we don't need Ukrainian propaganda because we uh, do love our country. Uh, because of this situation. I can just add that uh, patriotism is, is not just a word for us. Uh, it's uh, something, it's a value. Um, I don't really like the word patriotism, okay? So for me, it's not really what it is about. Uh, people are protecting their land. People are protecting, first of all, their, their families and their right to decide for themselves without uh, someone else uh, just coming to their house with the dirty shoes and saying them what to do. So this is, this is what is happening. And I will just uh, shortly answer to a question address, uh, addressed to me about uh, like non-white uh, migrants uh, crossing the border. We are uh, very aware of, of this, um, especially we were at the beginning of, 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 the, of this uh, full-scale invasion when, um, and, um, I personally uh, signed a petition uh, started uh, by the Ukrainian diaspora in the European Union, uh, in particularly in Poland, uh, with um, well, with the, with um, dedicated to to an equal uh, treatment of all the people fleeing the war in Ukraine. And if you see now, the European Commission actually uses uh, uses this uh, this term, people fleeing the war in Ukraine, which is inclusive, uh, which is which doesn't include those uh, who do, do not have uh, Ukrainian Ukrainian citizenship. And uh, one more thing about um, it, it, because this 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 issue ha has a lot of, of a lot of levels, and um, the uh, funny thing is uh, that uh, also Europeans have a lot of uh, expectations on uh, how uh, real refugees or true refugees should look like and should behave. Um, so uh, this need to kind of name the otherness and put it into the box sometimes creates um, well this misunderstanding when um, uh, refugees do not really uh, look or behave as we expect them to. Thank you. Okay, unfortunately, we don't have time for another round of, of questions, but um, I do want to um, thank um, our colleagues for sharing their, um, their, their research, but also their thoughts and, and their concerns, which are even more valuable. Um, and um, I would just like to um, th draw the clearest conclusion in just one second. I think it's great to consider differentiated integration to solve or manner of problems. Um, as long as uh, it's not based on uh, differentiated values. Uh, so uh, with that, I will give the floor back to Bridget, who is the host. Um. Well, I, I, I think we've come to the end of a very rich day and a half. And even though it was not even a day and a half, we had a very uh, rich, engaging and deep discussion. Uh, I it certainly confirmed for me that we were right in having a, a conference on a seminar on Ukraine and on differentiation. And of course, the conceptual issues around differentiation, the geographies of differentiation and integration, these issues have always been on the table and they will continue. But of course, uh, with the war in Ukraine and the return to war uh, of war to the continent, uh, 
certainly we don't know how transformative the moment is, but we do know that it has very significant consequences uh, for the whole of the continent and, and geopolitics, in my view, more broadly. Uh, and um, the contingency is such that there are lots of different pathways ahead. It's a very open future. But I, I would certainly say that part of that future will be Ukraine will be a member of the EU. And I don't think it's the unforeseen future either. But of course, there's all the contingency in the intervening period of a little war. Uh, so uh, these, these dynamics are messy, uh, unclear. I'm very struck by what Johanna said about how catastrophic the energy situation is. It terrifies me not just for this winter, but the, the next winters, but we also saw the map of Ukraine that it's happening there already, that dark patch uh, in, in the middle of Europe. Uh, but there is probably no way out of, uh, the EU has got to find a way of handling this because, um, and obviously there's also NATO in terms of security, but the EU is the pivot for the way in which this part of the world manages deep interdependence. And so, a lot rests on how this uh, complex, messy compound polity weaves its way, uh, weaves its way through this. But I want to thank you all, all of our speakers, all of the uh, discussants, the chairs, everyone who participated. It's been a really rich uh, discussion. For me, it's always wonderful to be back at the EUI and to be back in the Teatro. As Lorenzo knows, we, we launched the European Governance and Politics Programme in this room. Uh, and at the time, we had no money and no resources. And now it's a flourishing uh, program at uh, at the uh, at the Schumann Center. I want to thank my co-scientific organizers, particularly the directors of our sister projects. Uh, it's been a pleasure from the beginning, even long before we got dice. We worked extremely well together. But then I think there are two people in particular who should be thanked. Lorenzo, this simply would not have happened without him. We organized this conference so quickly uh, that at Sometimes I just thought, can we actually manage? Uh, but we did, uh, and it's thanks to Lorenzo. And then also, I know Mia isn't here, but I'd like to convey on your behalf our thanks to her for all of her effort at organizing this. And it was always one of the things that made me very proud to be director of the Schumann Center. And that was the way in which the staff in Schumann managed always to be very efficient and effective, but also do it with a lot of style and warmth. Uh, and I see that the good tradition of the Schumann Center has continued. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a very good thing. So my thanks to Lorenzo and to Mia, and I'll convey to Mia the thanks of the group, but I'm sure my co-directors would like to say something as well. Well then, all, all we can say is a la prossima. We'll be back. <laughs>